So welcome to our webinar today on decoding SMSF pension documents. It's a topic that we regularly talk about and explore with our SMSF members at Smarter SMSF, but also those that are using a variety of ways in which to prepare income stream documentation for their clients. So today is all about, and the reason why I use the word decoding is, is to help unpack what are the crucial elements and therefore what you should be looking for when it comes to the preparation of pension documents. And for those of you that may have been on a session like this before, this is the most common question we get when it comes to income stream based documents. So, and ultimately it comes back to this key question that I put at the very beginning. So what do you actually need to be aware of when it comes to pension documentation, both in the context of commencing, but also in the event of cessation? And we know that there can be multiple cessation events that can occur. It could be simply via a pension rollback, it could be via a uh, failure to have met the pension that requires a rollback. It could be through some other form of commutation. So understanding the nuances, not only in the context of what the law requires, but then the deed is crucial as well. And what we see in an ever-growing number of firms utilising our pension documents is that they are understanding the potential risks and or issues that come with the use of the templates out of SMSF software. Because like with death benefit nominations, as a very good example, this is an area that ultimately comes back to what the governing rules of the fund say. So when we look at income tax law, so the ITAA 1997, it talks about transfer balance cap obligations. It looks at ECPI. It looks at a whole range of those types of considerations. We look at our CIS Act and our CIS regs, and it sets out the obligations around paying an income stream, so i.e. an account-based pension in accordance with not only Reg 106, uh, subsection 1, but also in respect to 1069A that sets out the obligations of a um, minimum, for example, within Schedule 7. But in saying all that, the agreement to start and in which this pension would operate comes between the member and the trustee ultimately agreeing to do so. And this is where it comes back to the governing rules of the fund. And we talk quite often to people there and say, can I have my pension documents electronically signed, for example? Well, all that is incumbent upon whether the deed allows for that to occur and the conditions of the income stream. And this is why I'm going to spend so much time today working through all these things. So it's not simply going, let's just do it the most efficient way because it's all set up in BJL or class or super mate to do it. What we do find is, as you can see here, the more I read on this topic, the more I'm starting to question whether this is the right approach for our SMSF clients. And I want to start to unpack some of that for you today. So historically, what we know is there has been a bit of a gap. The software providers have really provided some of that gap, but it deals with what I'd call the basics of our income stream. So the fact that we, yes, we can have an account-based pension, we can have a TRIS, um, but we naturally have things like TRIS in retirement phase. We also have death benefit pensions or death benefit income streams as they are known. We do still have a, a legacy pension still floating around as well. And we do, still do see commutations from cap defined benefit income streams, lifetime compliant pensions into market pensions and so forth. But as I've reflected initially, there is this increased focus on documentation to manage many of those legal and compliant aspects. And the binding nominations is the most relevant that I talk to uh, here. And we have seen over a long period of time that these kind of standard templates that we had in this space have really disappeared off the back of the fact that the courts were taking a very um, structured view, consistent with what the ATO had said back in 2008, is that when it comes to something like a nomination, you follow what the deed says. And that was affirmed only in most recent times in the High Court decision of Hill and Zuda. 
We also then have expectations by the regulator and auditor on documents to support those relevant pension decisions. And only in recent times have we seen the updated and now finalised TR 2013-5 around when a pension commences and ceases. And again, the importance of understanding the impact of some changes that the ATO have put in there, in, in particular when it comes to a pension having failed and what needs to happen to ensure that the fund can continue to get ECPI in future years. And ultimately, this does boil down to the fact that there is a heavy reliance on our software providers to be able to produce these relevant templates for us. That is not the game that they're in, uh, and they don't naturally align those documents to the deeds that you may choose to utilise within your firm as well. Now, the alternate to this, and this is where I certainly started myself as an SMSF specialist practitioner many years ago, didn't ever really want to use those software documents. So ultimately, what we did is created our own. So there wasn't an opportunity in the marketplace for these templates were being created. So then what we did do is we built the relevant internal documents to enable us to ensure that all of those parts were covered in accordance with the operative deed of those particular clients that were at that stage of life. So where this has now led to, of course, is that we do have businesses like ours that now build out these documents that make it and align it, most importantly, to that operative deed that we have at Smarter SMSF. So as we start to decode these different areas for you, I want to go through a number of key sections to help you understand why each and all of these parts are important. And without question, as you'd know, as I always do, it always does start and come back to alignment with the deed. And we'll come into and talk a little bit about the importance of a PDS as well. So as you can see here, we have just an extract of some of the minutes of meetings that we can produce out of our SMSF softwares. Whilst in some instances that may be satisfactory, the first thing that we need to be very clear on is understanding the acceptable document format. So what does the trust deed say in respect to the contractual arrangement? Because that's what it is. It's a contractual arrangement between the member and the trustee or trustees of the fund to pay an income stream based upon the requirements set out within the CIS regulations and matching what the obligations sit within the Income Tax Assessment Act as well. So there is an assumption here, and I know different providers um, set out whether it may need to be done or is an accepted form in minutes or resolutions, or it may need some formal agreement, which again could be by virtue of deed. So you need to be very clear in the first instance that the pension can be created with minutes or resolutions if you are using your SMSF software. So understanding what the most acceptable deed, uh, what the most accepted deed, uh, deed pension format is in accordance with the fund's deed. Now, what we do with Smarter SMSF is that where we create our pension documentation, and yes, it is a series of resolutions that are done that ultimately the trustee uh, sign and the, and the members uh, obviously sign off to that as well, but we incorporate those doc that documentation as if it was embedded into the deed itself. So what we do with many of the documents that we have available with Smarter SMSF is we annex them by virtue of what we call a special rule of the fund. And you can see uh, here we have um, e extracts out of the deed around the fact that we can uh, create such a rule and we nominate that a particular document here um, does become a special rule. And the reason why we do that is that it therefore allows in a future point in time where agreed to between the trustee and the me member to be able to add or vary or change or otherwise amend to suit the change in circumstances that might apply to that particular client. Now, that naturally relates to a number of legal documents, but also does incorporate a member's pension. It does require the member and the trustee to effectively declare 
that it is to become a special rule of fund and which is why as we go through the pension documents you'll actually see a question around the use of the smarter smsf deed and the fact that it ultimately then annexes itself as if it was a part of the deed itself now why is all this stuff important well it's important because there may be situations if you want to make changes to the income stream that it would require a commutation, so a rollback and then recommencement of the income stream. So if you have accumulation benefits naturally that are sitting within this, you might have a client that's in excess of their transfer balance account. What you're ultimately going to do is contaminate some of that pension information, so our tax-free and taxable component, with other monies that would sit in the accumulation account. Now, that also has an impact on clients that may be in receipt of Commonwealth Seniors Health Card or some form of age pension requirement as well, especially if those pensions predate 1 January 2015, where there was at that point in time a change in the deeming rate and then a change in the assessment for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card around those particular pensions. And I'm sure uh, if you've ever had a client that's lost their Commonwealth Seniors Health Card, you know, it's not a very pleasant experience having that conversation with them. So making sure you understand what type of document is required, first and foremost, and then understanding whether the way in which the pension documents are constructed would allow for alterations to actually happen midstream, which is effectively what we're saying here. And, and the NTLG, the former National Tax Liaison Group Superannuation Committee, what the ATO said in this regard is that it does it depends. And it ultimately depends, the ability to make these changes midstream, come back to the rules of the fund, so the governing rules, our trust deed, and the rules of the income stream. And without having that set in place, and therefore the importance of the deed and the income stream allowing for these things to occur, then you are going to have to fall back to that commutation of repurchase. And those elements that I spoke about before ultimately come at risk. So... When we think about some of these issues at the commencement, as I've touched on earlier, we do have our tax ruling 2013-5. It's the Bible of pensions in theory. So when an income stream commences in accordance with the tax ruling, ultimately is determined by reference to the terms and conditions of that income stream. So one, two, you can see there's it is agreed by the trustee and the member. And the rules of the income stream are set out effectively in the governing rules or and or within the terms of the pension. Now, what's interesting here is any well-constructed deed when it comes to pensions isn't going to be too prescriptive. And what I mean by that is, is you don't want to have all of the conditions set out within the deed that any time there is a change, you're then going to have to make a deed change as well. So minimum pension factors stipulated within, within the rules might be a good example where it might have determined that if they were between a particular age, you needed to take 4%. And then during COVID, when that was halved, you were still required to take 4%. So that, that sort of stuff, we want to keep um, quite fluid so that then when we have changes that may or may not occur, we can assess it on its own merits to determine whether that change needs to happen. But what you can see down the bottom left-hand corner is, is rule 25.1 is our rule that talks about the specific payments to trustees and the fact that it can be paid as a superannuation income stream or a superannuation lump sum. So Therefore, if, if we look at the deed and it is quite um, light on or generic in terms of the powers that the trustee has to pay benefits, well, then what we're looking for is more specific terms and referencing into the, into the pension documents themselves. So are these terms and conditions explicit within the pension documents or are they silent and therefore require a referencing back to the deed? And what's quite common we see with our SMSF pension documents we get out of our software is that they are quite light on in the context of many of those um, requirements or terms and conditions that we'd need. So what we end up is, is a bit of a circular argument because the pension docs say, well, these are done in accordance with the deed. But what does the deed say? Because the deed basically says, well, it's done in accordance with 
you know, the, the rules of the um, superannuation laws. And again, that might be a defined term. So again, looking at how does the deed define how the agreement applies to start the pension? So is it by deed, resolution or other mechanism? And most importantly, as we've said, it must be a two-way contractual agreement between the member and the trustee. So we cannot simply have a resolution by the trustee that says the pension started. There must be, in essence, three pieces of information that we're looking for. One is a member's request to commence the pension. Two would be the resolutions by the trustee determining that that pension is to commence. Uh, and then there would be notification back to that member from the trustee confirming the particulars of that income stream and you would have the member ultimately um, verify or, or um, ultimately sign off on, on the acceptance to those terms as well. So again, if you're using your standard software pension documents, um, have you reviewed these against the deed to ensure that you're not posing any risks around the operation of the income stream as well? The PDS is a really interesting one because this ultimately is a question of do you actually need one or not? Now, what we do know is that the Corporations Act requires a PDS to be issued when a member converts from accumulation to pension phase. So that is that is legislated within Section 102B of the Corporations Act. Now, what we do have, and this is where um, many people try and rely on this, is that we have a limited exemption. And what this limited exemption does is that if it is on reasonable grounds that the member has received or has and knows they have access to all of the information that the PDS would be required to contain, then they don't need to be issued with a PDS. Okay, so let me just go through that again. A limited exception does exist if on reasonable grounds to believe that the member has received or has and know they have access to all the information contained in that PDS, then we could apply that exemption and not have to issue the PDS there. So the argument is, is well, they're a trustee and member of their own SMSF. They kind of should know all the rules around this stuff. So therefore, do we actually have an obligation to provide that? This to me comes back to the risks that you have made in the decision for the client by not issuing the PDS. Because by not issuing the PDS in with those pension documents, the default position is, is that you're assuming that the client's understanding is sufficient. The reality in my view would be that client's understandings as a member would be insufficient to know all the terms and conditions and obligations of paying that income stream. So therefore, the default position would be that we would want to issue a PDF. So you're taking on a level of risk here by assuming or having an assumption here that the member knows all the elements that they would need to know in making that decision to start that income stream. So my default view, and which is why we have it with the Smarter SMSF documents, is issue the PDS. Now we know SMSF software providers don't provide a PDS. And again, a lot of that is linked to the fact that we don't have a specific deed that connects itself to those documents and to its governing rules. So we have a specific pension PDS it incorporates some of our standard deed PDS, but includes a whole range of other information that is really important in the context of the member knowing how that income stream operates. So what do we then include in that PDS? Well, the term and the type of pension being paid, what the admin tax legal actuarial considerations are around establishing and running the income stream, the advantages and disadvantages naturally of pensions, whether it's commutable, reversionary, estate planning implications and stuff as well. And as you can see on the right-hand side there, it includes that member acknowledgement to be signed that demonstrates that it's actually been issued to the member and they understand ultimately or have, have acknowledged that they have read the product disclosure statement in respect to the commencement of that particular income stream. So that really touches on in the first instance that alignment back to deed and the issuing of a PDS when we are looking specifically at our uh, Corporations Act obligation there and whether you are, in essence, making that decision for your client or not and the risks that may come in doing so. 
So then we move on to what should be in our SMSF pension document. So let's start to decode this. And for a lot of our um, software-based documents, what we naturally know is that if we have pensions that start on the 1st of July, well, how do we ensure that our paperwork reflects that that is occurring without actually having to backdate those documents? So has there been some sort of formal request that has been done? It could be done orally. It could be done by written notice as well. So our SMSF software documentation, that interest really doesn't provide us with that recognition of the member's intent to start at an earlier stage. So therefore, when we put in all that information into our SMSF software and we say, well, it's a 1 July, it's naturally going to prepare paperwork at that point in time. And then ultimately we've got some things that maybe we shouldn't be uh, backdating that, um, uh, you know, A, because of the fact that uh, we needed that notification originally, but B, we obviously know that there are some T-bar requirements that we need to do as well. And this led us to developing, um, I guess, a, a suite of ways in which pensions can ultimately commence. And uh, what we've had for a long time on the platform is the ability to, A, start a pension if it's going to start on the 1st of July, have the individual commence at that date, but have an oral request that effectively then when the pension documents are signed, confirms that original oral request, okay? So when the pension docs that are produced on Smarter SMSF, they can be signed at the date in which the client is ultimately signing on the basis that there is an oral request of the member's intent to start from the 1st of July in that particular year. Now, that uh, works and works fine and is compliant with the rules in TR 2013-5. We did have an interesting member story in the past sort of 18 months or so where um, we did have a client that lost capacity and subsequently died between the start date of that oral request and ultimately the document preparation. So what we have in terms of this document suite is for you to now choose the path that you want to go down. So you can import using your integration with class, BGL, Supermate, you can integrate and pull all the relevant data that you need, the fund name, the trustees, the members, the components, all that sort of stuff. But what you do have the ability to do, and I might jump over to our um, platform here and, and just take you through this, is that you do have this opportunity to now go in and make that decision whether you want to have a two-step process or whether you want to um, effectively just use that oral request. And that two-step process here, and I'm just going to uh, use one that I prepared earlier, uh, that two-step process ultimately allows you to develop um, at this point in time now, so we're in July, August, uh, and allows you to produce that initial request. So we can see uh, in here we've got our, uh, I'm just going to go back a page in a second. So on our first page here, we've got our um, trustee and member information. So um, we obviously we can get all that data coming in through the integration here. So integrations naturally sitting at the top of the page here to be able to do this. So all of this information is going to um, populate uh, into the form here. Uh, we have our, our trustees, we have our directors, um, all the information will populate in about the relevant addresses, dates of birth of the individuals and so forth as well. Uh, and then again, through that integration, we'll be able to get all that other detail again, based upon what you have already populated into the commencement information that you have within your SMSF software. Now, there are a couple of little tricks and tips and stuff that we have um, put into here. So if it's being paid under the Smarter SMSF deed, it will populate that rule automatically. But you also note here that it will become a special rule of the fund. And then you can select whether it's become a paramount document. I'll talk about that more shortly. But you can see here is whether we know that the account balance is known to start the income stream. Um, if it's not, 
then what we can do is we can do that two-step process, as I said before. In this instance, we may include the fact that we'd already done that original step. So then what we would do is in our second set of documents here, it would allow us to maybe align that back to the um, start of the year when that original one was prepared and then our relevant components and so forth are being displayed here as well. Now, if you are starting, if you don't know the balance at this point in time, then ultimately the components and stuff that you can see on the screen are not going to display and are not going to generate in the first set of documents that ultimately get produced here. So the idea, uh, I'm just going to wait for that. Something's obviously not enjoying the the load time, but ultimately what we have here, you can see there that the uh, starts with no, and then we have the ability to then look at when we are going to start it, whether we're going to start it with a specific amount or to the members accumulation based upon the whole balance at that point in time, um, and then go through from there. Most importantly, when that has been prepared, it will then create a saved order for you to go back into here and then once you do have that balance finalized, you would be able to go in and ultimately finish off that particular order. So you've got the opportunity, as I was showing you on that page, to either produce an oral request where you know that balance, you've just finished the accounts, um, and you want to start a pension, say, from the 1st of July here, you can do that. If you don't know the balance and you want to go through a written two-step process, You'll be able to go through that, as you can see on the screen right now. At this stage, we don't know the balance. We are going to start with the entire interest. Um, you would go through and you would complete all the other relevant information. You can see here payment details, reversionaries, and that sort of thing. It'll create a saved order. And then once you come back to this, you'll then be able to finish off. Now that you know what that income stream value is, You'll be able to, if you want to, go and link it to the original request and then put that request date in and you'll be able to refresh your connection in essence with your SMSF software to enable the population of those relevant components that you can see there as well. So I'm just going to jump back again to our main screen here and work our way back through some of these slides. So that's really what the um, table is showing you on the right-hand side here as a workflow as to how we've been able to address this issue for many of our clients. So this prospective nature of us making sure that we date documents is crucial. So it's not okay to simply backdate. And what we do know is that where we... Um, we look at our ruling in paragraph 12, it talks about that the commencement date cannot occur prior to the day established as the commencement date in the terms and condition as agreed to between the member and the trustee that will govern that income stream. So again, as you can see on the right-hand side here, what we need to ensure that we've got is the trustee and the member must agree to the terms and conditions of the income stream before it can be commenced. Um, so that member notification is crucial there. And in this instance, as you can see uh, in the text on the document there in that notification, the individual is hereby confirming their previous oral request to commence that superannuation income stream from that particular interest at that particular point in time. Okay, so they are setting out a whole range of things there that then the trustees will resolve to confirm and then approve as part of the commencement of the income stream. Now, a couple of other interesting things here when it comes back to the construct of these pensions. And one of the things that we need to be absolutely clear on is how the context of the income stream has been set up and the way in which benefit payments must be paid. Because if we don't have any discretion in respect to the way the benefit payments must be dealt with, then we are obliged under the terms and conditions to pay that pension exactly in accordance with how those terms and conditions have been set up. So if we have a client that has a pension minimum of $50,000, 
But in the documentation that may have come out of our SMSF software, we say that the individual is to be paid $5,000 monthly. We are bound by those terms and conditions to pay $60,000 to that individual. Now, if there is another income stream in that period of the, in that financial year that may have a shortfall, then ultimately what the ATO is saying in their example here is, is that you cannot reallocate without breaching the terms and conditions of that pension unless ultimately you have a level of discretion built into it. So you can see the example on the top right hand side here. One member receives two pensions and the trustee does not satisfy the minimum payment for one pension, but does for the other. So they're in receipt of two pensions from the fund. The member has redrawn an amount well in excess of the minimum required from pension one, but failed to meet the minimum in pension two. The trustee must ensure that each pension meets the minimum payments. It is irrelevant that the combined income received by member A from those two pensions equates to an amount greater than the combined amounts. Subject to satisfying all of the conditions, the trustee may be able to apply for the concession to treat as having been continually paid despite the underpayment. That's naturally going into the requirements of the 112 shortfall rules. So there really is a question of fact as to whether more pensions should be or might be failing the pension standards that are actually occurring. So how do we deal with this? Well, we deal with this by virtue of a couple of important steps. So one is, is we make it abundantly clear that there is discretion in respect to that payment. So I'm just going to put a, a couple of numbers in here quickly to then allow us to move um, to the next screen. Uh, if it wants to come up, there we go. We might just leave uh, that there. Just going to change that one to no. Obviously, the shared screen doesn't want to give me a lot of love. So I'll go back to next there. Yep. So we will be starting this. With the entire balance in this instance. And that naturally gives us our tax free and taxable component that you can see there. And then what we're asking here on the next page is what level of income stream is being paid. So are we setting a specific amount or because we have a minimum that is ultimately being calculated here based upon the relevant um, percentage for that particular year? And then you will see here as well, it'll then talk to us about the amount that the member is going to take as a payment. So in this instance, we're going to be looking at taking at least the minimum payment. So that is the um, uh, selection that the individual will make. If we are going to take at least the minimum, we do have the ability to um, make the irrevocable election to treat any above minimum pension amounts as uh, maybe a commutation or from the accumulation account. I'm not gonna worry about that at, at this point in time. And then we have our payment frequency. So are we going to be specifying what the rules of the income stream re require us to absolutely take? Or are we going to leave it at the unfettered discretion of the trustee here? And ultimately, giving that level of trustee discretion will ensure that we don't end up in a situation. Um, we don't end up in a situation whereby the trustee won't be able to effectively move that from one to the other. So there is a question here, Karina asks, what are the documentation requirements for a reversionary pension? Um, so we will get to that shortly. Uh, it is ultimately going to come down to uh, in here, uh, in the first instance, I guess, with this income stream, are we going to actually uh, create a reversionary in the first place? So, or are we going to effectively set up a new death benefit income stream? We do have in our suite of documents the ability for you 
to actually continue that reversionary. So we've got those documents available to use. But equally, if, if it is not reversionary, then you would have the ability to create a death benefit income stream as well. And that's something that we've just released. Um, and we'll talk about that more a little bit short, a little bit more shortly. So I'm going to jump back to our slides again. Uh, and just again, highlight a couple of final things um, on, on this particular page as well. So uh, it does come back to the fact that having that level of trustee discretion gives you the opportunity to reallocate. Okay, so there is a requirement here in the documents that the directors advise of that initial minimum. Um, and then the trustees naturally will go through a range of procedural aspects in the lodgement of the T-bar, um, so on and so forth. And then we look at, well, what other areas do we need to decode? So reversionary beneficiaries, as Karina had just asked. So are we simply reverting that income stream 100% to an individual? Are we looking to revert a dollar amount? Are we looking to revert a percentage? So we do have that ability for you to look at how you might want to structure um, the, the reversionary uh, allocation based upon the individual circumstances, looking at asset segregation. So going across the top onto the right. So again, how does the pension deal with whether we want to set aside assets to support the payment of the income stream? Are we assigning particular assets to the uh, income stream? And if so, what are those documents and how do they add up to the commencing value of that income stream? Um, we did touch on, and I showed you in that form, the fact that there may be some other strategic opportunities. So the pension commencement form allows you to make an election in respect to that income stream. So on dealing with amounts that may be greater than the minimum for that particular year. And we know, and we've known for some time under the commutation rules, that that decision, that election that's being made must be a prospective decision for commutations. Otherwise, we would fail the requirements of a commutation within TR 2013-5, and it would mean that any payment that is taken is treated as a pension payment, and therefore we don't get that debit in respect to um, the clawback that we'd want through that commutation process. So, and again, just sort of finishing off that one, the changing of the midstream uh, requirements. So again, going back to what our governing rules say, uh, and then ensuring that lines up with the terms of the pension and the deed as the ATO had previously uh, instructed. So jumping to the next page. So we do have, like I said, a single form here that covers account-based pensions and trisses. Um, we now have a separate form that covers our death benefit income stream. So this is one area uh, that we've spent a lot of work on recently. Um, we've got our ordinary pension commencement. We spent a lot of time building in these particular features that you can see in here. Um, what we have been doing is we've been uh, introducing uh, or, or creating, uh, whilst we've been sort of working through on this, our uh, just got to actually remember the, because we are about to sort of release this uh, documents. Death benefit income stream. So in, in a very similar guise to what we have with our pension commencement document, we now have the ability for you to create a death benefit income stream. So Karina, to your question, um, if we have a pension that reverts, then we have had and have had for some time the um the continuation of the auto reversionary pension. So that will allow you to produce. Um, documentation in respect to that pension ultimately migrating from the deceased member over to the new member. This death benefit income stream here uh, is ultimately creating a brand new pension based upon the fact that we have a tax dependent that wishes to start a new pension here as well. And, and naturally, there are some um, slight changes in this particular form because uh, what it's actually doing. I might just put some stuff in here quickly. Um, what we have in, in respect to this form is that we are 
going to have things like who the who the uh, individual was that passed away. We're going to have um, you know a number of things about the age of the individual, for example. We're going to have um, yeah a, a whole range of stuff that will help determine what we actually need to have completed. So I'm just going to put in here uh, Jane Smith. Um, so in here we've got so John Smith that died, for instance. Uh, and John might have been 80 at the time that he died. And then what we've got is we've got the, the pension particulars. So Jane, in this instance, would be she's the spouse. So we we actually cover um, a number of different factors that you can see in here as to who those recipients can be. Um, we'll have the date of birth of the uh, pension recipient because that will help determine the uh, the accessibility of, of the income stream. In this instance, John's over 60. So regardless of how old Jane is, um, she would in essence receive uh, this income stream herself. Uh, obviously, then we're getting all that other information that you can see in there as well. So we now have, um, a, I guess, a, a complete set, uh, again, in respect to the death benefit income stream uh, that allows for that commencement to occur, as I've said, um, but we then also have, <coughs> pardon me, the ability to create pensions ordinarily, account-based pensions, transition to retirement income streams uh, from our normal pension commencement document that you can see uh, here as well. So both of those um, are available for you to now utilise as part of that process. And as I um, touched on uh, as we went through before, we do have those abilities to create either a two-step process or one-step process in respect to those. Uh, the fact that if you do use that two-step process, you would be able to uh, effectively create a saved order and go back and, and complete that uh, as part of the process as well. And some inbuilt smarts that ultimately sit within these documents to just help ensure that you are creating what is going to be a compliant set of documents here. So a very simple one, for example, if someone's over age 65, then allows, it can only pay an ABP, not a TRIS, because the cashing condition has been met of attaining age 65. If a nil cashing condition has been met, like an ABP, then you're only going to be able to fill in the unrestricted benefit area, not the preserved and restricted documents um, or components that you could see on the screen earlier. So those sort of things, pretty clever features that were built into that as well. Um, also, you can see, as I showed you earlier, the ability to either choose the entire balance or a selected amount that will naturally calculate the relevant components. Um, it does, does also factor in things like pro rata calcs. If it started after the 1st of June, there's no minimum. Um, the elections that we spoke about, the reversionary details, the ability to create segregation all of those are all standard features as part of the ordering process. Um, I talked already about the fact that if it's a smarter SMSF deed, the pension uh, documents itself can become a special rule of the fund. Uh, and we also have a concept in these documents around what we call a paramount document. And this paramount document is a defined term within the deed. So ultimately, what a paramount document means is it's a document or an agreement that is made as a special rule of the fund that will take precedence and priority in whole or in part um, that purports to when we have a situation where something else purports to act differently to what that document's trying to do. So the most obvious one might be a binding nomination and you may have a reversionary pension here. So there are two very different uh, instructions that are occurring if the pension may be referred as that paramount document, or conversely, the other one is, then in essence, that document will outrank the document that isn't recognised as a paramount document in that situation. So when you go through and if you do complete an order that with that unknown balance, you will um, not only get that completed order, but you'll also get some instructions around the process of that second step um, that you can see there as well. So there's a, there's a number of things that are available for you to, to look at and to understand as we sort of decoded the importance, the important elements of the pension documents there. Now, the other part that I wanted to talk about um, is the updated view and decoding what the commissioner has set out with the ATO's new views in TR 2013-5 around failing the pension rules. 
because what we have seen in this updated ruling is that it does change a or does contain a fairly significant change around when an income stream has failed the pension standards. Okay, so one example of failing the pension standards is the fact that the minimum pension has not been met. Now, what the ATO has had for some period of time within this ruling is their view in respect to the income tax laws on this. And they have said that in respect to the year in which the pension failed, the fund would not be entitled to any exempt current pension earning. They didn't have any particular view around trust law concepts and CIS in respect to, well, does that mean that in the following year, the pension automatically, in essence, refreshes for an income tax point of view? So we haven't ceased the pension for superannuation law purposes, but we did for income tax purposes, but we didn't need to make any changes to that pension. It, it, it in, in essence, restarted, uh, for sake of a better word, for income tax to allow for the tax exemption to occur in the following year. What the ATO has now made very clear within this ruling is that for earnings tax exemption to apply in a subsequent year, there must be a conscious decision to commute the income stream and then commence a new income stream. Okay, so we now have clarity from the tax office that says not only do we lose our tax exemption in that particular year, you will lose it in subsequent years unless there has been a conscious decision to commute and repurchase that income stream. Okay, so we know there are several implications around failing a pension. So we have a loss of ECPI, we have some T-bar reporting requirements, we potentially have some contamination of our tax-free and taxable components. And with TRISAs, we also potentially have some illegal early release issues off the back of that as well. So we've made, again, some specific changes around our um, pension rollback documents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to our saved orders that you can see here. And I've got this rollback of pension document that you can see. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what we've done in terms of the documentation um, on the form that we've done here to help you understand um, the differences and nuances of the documents that will get credit. So I'm not going to go back. You can see we have captured our fund and trustee details. Again, use your integrations to do all this sort of stuff. We have our um, types of pensions here. So is it a TRIS? Is it an account-based pension? Is it a TRIS in the retirement phase? All of those elements will produce different templates um, for you. The rule, again, is it a smart arrest MSF deed? Is it a another deed? Um, and then what we've got here is the reason for the rollback. So is this a member request to roll back the pension? You may be doing it as part of a pension reboot strategy with some contributions, or is it as a result of having failed the pension standards? So this is not in respect to the one twelfth continuation of the pension, um, where you might use the Commissioner's General Powers of Administration. Again, we have a separate document that covers that particular scenario. But this is where we know the pension has failed for that year and there is no relief in respect to that. Um, we can see in here, if the pension has failed due to the pension standards, then we would be undertaking that rollback. So the date of that rollback would be the 1st of July in that particular year. And then we would need to be determining the value that is being rolled back for the accumulation, uh, back to accumulation at that point in time as well. Okay, so, um, and then again, subject to the type of pension being paid, um, it is going to produce different sets of documents. Quite clearly, if we've got a transition to retirement income stream that has failed the pension, we have illegal early access issues. And again, we've touched on and we've covered in those templates the relevant views expressed by the ATO as to what we need to do around that pension having ceased and, and how the benefit payments that have been taken effectively as lump sums are in essence uh, early, illegal early access and would be taxed as the ordinary income rates of that individual, so added to their taxable income for that particular income year. So again, this is something that we've recently added off the back of the 
uh, ATO's updated guidance. Uh, I've done what I have done, if I actually can type, is we've created some um, uh, sample documents. We've also uh, created some videos that help explain that in a little bit more detail. So if we go to the pension rollback uh, and you search that up, you can see here we have a sample document for, um, in this instance, the member request. We've got a TRIS rollback with the failed pension standards. So you can go in and as members, you can go in and access this and um, obviously uh, go and have a look at those templates to understand what we've done a little bit further. <laughs> Once that comes up and it naturally it, it goes through all the relevant elements that we know need to actually occur. Uh, so T-bar and, and so on and so forth. So you can see uh, all the relevant information that we talk about from an ECPI point of view, the, the treatment for lump sum, the treatment for T-bar, et cetera, et cetera. All right, well, let's sort of take things back to our slides and just wrap up today's session for you. So ultimately, we have a fairly comprehensive suite of documents when it comes to pensions. So whether it's uh, fairly simple in terms of satisfying conditions of release, starting our income streams, both in the context of our account-based pensions and death benefits, the ability to pay lump sums, whether it be in cash or in specie, uh, it may be through various conditions of release, attaining age 65. It could be through permanent incapacity. We've got our member rollbacks, as I've just shown. So whether it's done on member request or failed the pension standards, partial commutations, the ability to do things like annual pension reviews, again, that can encapsulate um, strategies like above minimum pension elections, moving trisses into the retirement phase, minimum pension shortfalls, adding and removing uh, reversionaries, um, market link pensions, um, commutations, those sort of things. We do have templates available if you do come across scenarios like that, temporary incapacity income streams. And the one that we do a little bit of work in is when you might be picking up a client and you can't find those pension documents. So the fact that we have the ability to create a deed of affirmation and confirmation and then develop a set of replacement documents for the clients, which follows the Naruman decision um, back in 2018. And there are still some things that we're waiting on. Uh, legacy pensions is a good example there. And again, if we do get any resolution on those amnesties that have been previously announced in budget measures, we will come back to you uh, and have those documents available to use as well. Um, we do have naturally the benefits of our subscription packages that would enable you to um, utilize these documents and a whole range all documents effectively available on the platform. So if you would like to find out more about those subscription packages, if you're not already a member, um, you can get in contact with David uh, and he'd be more than happy to take you through um, what those um, subscription packages are like and, and how they ultimately work. There will be some price changes in the not too distant future. So uh, great opportunity to lock in um, the current prices there. So some key takeaways for you from today. I guess we've tried to help you decode and understand why certain elements within your pension documents are really important. And one of the very first parts that we need to make sure as to why is that we have absolute alignment to our funds governing rules. It is critical that you get your pension documents right. You don't want them being challenged, that the income stream was established and managed in an incorrect way. Uh, you know, if we look at the context of our binding death benefit nominations, I could see something in the near future being challenged on whether that pension was reversionary or not based upon the fact that those pension documents were or were not established in accordance with the rules of the fund. Now, whether that would stand up or not, we don't know, but we clearly don't want to be the first ones in that situation with a client because quite clearly I'll be training on that topic uh, at some point in the future as well. Gives you an opportunity as well with our pension documents to take advantage of those strategy opportunities that may present, so those elections that we spoke about. Um, we also know that the ATO's change in position uh, is crucial and what you need to do around when a pension ceases, uh, whether it's in a member request sense, but more importantly, because of the failed pension standards. And then just using these documents in a way that we understand, yes, it might not be as quick and efficient as using it through 
um, your SMSF software, but the fact that you can integrate with your softwares, whether it's through Be Simple Fun 360, Class and Supermate, we know that you will be saving time, um, but without compromising on the quality and management of your client risk as well. So that pretty much takes us to the end of today. If you do have any questions that you'd like to ask in respect to uh, this topic in particular, you can feel free to do so. Otherwise, we do have a range of events coming up. Most importantly, next week, Tim and I will be doing our SMSF Pensions Masterclass. So we'll be going through a lot of technical detail around the operation of pensions. Uh, so if you haven't registered as a member, you should have your member registration email to join us. You will get a reminder on Monday if you haven't as well. Um, for those that haven't, uh, that are not members, A, think about being a member, or B, uh, you can sign up on our events page you can see on this slide. And we do have a range of other upcoming events that you can keep an eye out for and register. Again, all of those are listed on our events page, smartersmsf.com forward slash events. And this session, like many of the sessions that we run, are uh, um, added to our YouTube channel. Uh, Tim and I also record our weekly Feeling Smarter videos as well. So if you haven't subscribed there, you can join a couple of hundred people that um, get those uh, videos uh, each and every week, pretty much, uh, and find out a little bit more and, and keep you up to date, not only with what's happening at Smarter SMSF, but also on a technical front as well. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you all for joining me today. If we don't have any other questions, uh, that'll do. Have a great rest of the day and bye for now.